What is the difference between the IPCC, World Economic Forum, United Nations Climate Change Science, and the science of Einstein's special theory of relativity? This video will show you that there is quite a large difference. But the fundamental difference is that one is based on an assumption or premise that has never been shown to be incorrect, while one is based on an assumption or premise that has often been shown to be incorrect. The importance of this is very well explained by the physicist and Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, in his student lectures. Speaking to his audience, he describes the scientific method. In general, he says, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. There is audience laughter. No, don't laugh, he says. That's the truth. And then we compare the guess to nature. We compare it to the experiment or experience to see if it works. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't matter how smart you are, who made the guess or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. With this knowledge, we can start our comparison of the approaches adopted by the IPCC, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum, with that of Einstein. He based his theory on an assumption. He wrote in his explanation of the special theory of relativity that, let us assume that the simple law of the constancy of the velocity of light c in vacuum is justifiably believed by the child at school. The important implication of this assumption is that light can never be observed to travel faster than the constant C. As Feynman explained, to be scientific, Einstein now needed to compare his assumption with experiment or experience. To do this, he first devised a Gedanken experiment. He imagined a train running along rail lines coordinate system K1. An embankment parallel to the train forms a stationary coordinate system K. The train is travelling at a velocity equal to V. What is the velocity of the train relative to the embankment K? In classical physics, that is straightforward. It is equal to V. But now, Einstein imagines a man walking inside the train carriage with a velocity w relative to the train. What is the velocity of the man relative to the embankment? Again, to answer this, we can revert to the classical laws of motion and the addition of velocities. The velocity of the man relative to the embankment Classically, is V plus W. But now, this is where Einstein follows the scientific method and challenges his own assumption that the velocity of light is constant in vacuum and equal to C. He says, let us inquire about the velocity of propagation of the ray of light relative to the carriage. It is obvious he wrote that we can here apply the consideration of the previous section, since the ray of light plays the part of the man walking along relatively to the carriage. So, instead of the man walking inside the carriage with velocity w, we replace the man with a ray of light. We can imagine, for example, a torch being turned on inside the carriage and a ray of light travelling at velocity equal to c. And now we ask, what is the velocity of the ray of light relative to the embankment? We invoke the classical addition of velocities, and the velocity of the ray of light relative to the embankment is v plus c. But this cannot be. Nothing can exceed velocity c. Einstein covers this problem in section 7, of his book, 
the apparent incompatibility of the law of propagation of light with the principle of relativity. He solves this problem by using a transformation that had previously been developed by the Dutch Nobel laureate H. A. Lawrence. This was a set of transformations for the moving coordinate system K1. It transforms the distance travelled and the time taken. So when we use the Lorentz transformation instead of the classical addition of velocities, the velocity of the ray of light travelling in the railway carriage relative to the embankment is restored to equal C. And just to emphasise the importance of Einstein's assumption that the velocity of light C in vacuum is constant and cannot be exceeded, it is also the premise of the Lorentz transformation. If we look at this transformation formula for x1, the square root of 1 minus v squared divided by c squared, we can see that if anything did travel with the velocity v that was greater than the velocity of light c, then this would result in a square root of a negative number and the Lorentz transformation would break down. And thus, both the Lorentz transformation and the special theory of relativity would disagree with experience and would be wrong. That's all there is to it. But nothing has ever been recorded travelling faster than the velocity of light in a vacuum C, not even at CERN and the Large Hadron Collider, which accelerates part particles as fast as possible. No particle has ever exceeded the velocity C. Einstein's assumption therefore agrees with experience and is correct, proven by a strict scientific method. We can now move on to compare Einstein's scientific method with that of the United Nations World Economic Forum and the IPCC. They all seek to reduce carbon dioxide emissions to net zero, as proclaimed in the United Nations COP26 conference and on the World Economic Forum website and detailed in the latest IPCC report of 2021. In the report, it shows charts that details potential future levels of carbon dioxide and that say future emissions cause future additional warming, with total warming dominated by past and future carbon dioxide emissions. So the assumption of these three bodies can be simply stated as an increase in the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide causes an increase in global average temperature. Harking back to Richard Feynman, we will compare that guess or assumption to experience. We can first turn to our experience of the present Holocene period. This graph shows global average temperature from around 10,000 BCE to 1950. It shows a steady rise in global temperature from the end of the last glacial period up to a point about 6,500 years ago or 4,500 BCE. This was the warmest 200 year long interval when GMST was about 0 0.7 degrees Celsius, that is between 0 0.3 and 1.8 degrees Celsius, warmer than the 19th century. Then, for the next 4,000 years, global temperature gradually dropped at a rate of 0 0.08 degrees Celsius per thousand years that is between minus 0 0.24 and minus 0 0.05 degrees Celsius, as shown here. Now, according to the climate change science assumption, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide should have logically been decreasing during this time. 
But in fact, it was increasing for almost the entire 4,000 years. So, the climate science assumption disagreed with experience. It is therefore wrong. But now, let us move on to the recent modern period. This is the NOAA tool that covers global temperature from 1880 right up to 2021. We will use it to examine that interval. We start with the period 1880 to 1930 inclusive, making it 51 years. The atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration level increased from 290 parts per million to 307 parts per million. But global average temperature decreased over the same period at a rate of 0.01 degrees Celsius per decade. The climate science assumption again disagrees with experience. Just 10 years later, we have identified a 41 year period of interest, 1940 to 1980. During this time, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration increased from 310 parts per million to 335 parts per million. The NOAA dataset over that same period shows absolutely no change to the global average temperature. The climate science assumption is again wrong. Moving closer to the present time, we compare the assumption to the period 1987 to 1996. This saw atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations increase from 348 parts per million to 362 parts per million. Global average temperature fell at a rate of minus 0.03 degrees Celsius per decade. The climate science assumption is shown to be wrong. Very close to the present, 2001 to 2008, during which time atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations increased from 370 parts per million to 385 parts per million. But global average temperature fell at a rate of minus 0.02 degrees Celsius per decade. The assumption is wrong. And now to the most recent period 2015 to 2021, the last seven years during which time atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations climbed from 400 parts per million to 416 parts per million. And global average temperature has fallen at a rate of minus 0.09 degrees Celsius per decade. At this point, we can summarize. Over the period 1880 to 2021, inclusive, that's 142 years, there has been a correlation between atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration increases and global average temperature increases for only 25 years. Over the same period, 1880 to 2021, there has been no correlation between atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration increases and global average temperature increases over periods covering 117 years. During the current Holocene interglacial period, there was an interval of around 4,000 years when atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration increased but global average temperature decreased 
significantly. This is the telling statistic. For over 80% of the period 1880 to 2021, an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration did not cause a corresponding increase in global average temperature. The fundamental assumption of the IPCC World Economic Forum and the United Nations is thus wrong. That's all there is to it. We now come to our concluding remarks. We have demonstrated that while Einstein's special theory of relativity is based on an assumption or premise that has never been shown to be incorrect. The IPCC World Economic Forum United Nations hypothesis is based on an assumption or premise that has often been shown to be incorrect. At the very least, there must be great doubt around the wisdom of the net zero strategy. According to the United Nations, transitioning to a net zero world is one of the greatest challenges humankind has faced. It calls for nothing less than a complete transformation of how we produce, consume and move about. How governments can contemplate such an action based on the flimsy evidence we have just discussed is incomprehensible unless there is another motive. We will leave it there, but on a lighter note, it may be worth anticipating the objections of those that support the net zero hypothesis. They often object to analyses such as we have presented by saying it is merely cherry picking pieces of data. Our response to that is twofold. One, there were a lot of cherries to pick from, over 80%. And two, we adopted the same approach with Einstein's special theory of relativity. But there were no cherries to be picked. This community combines the topics of climate change, COVID-19 and the new world order. If you would like to join our community, you can find us on locals.com. The New World Order. This link will take you directly to our site.